The Husqvarna Viking Rose Type 600 is a late 90s model sewing machine that gives very consistent and reliable stitching. Its heartbreak feature is that it can develop a blank LCD problem when you turn it on. I have good news, I've returned two to working order, and that's what we're going to cover today in this video. I own two Viking Rose Type 600s because when my original went dark at 12 years of age, it was cheaper to purchase a working one on eBay rather than buy the logic board or power supply, the two suspect components. You will be able to identify my original one by the blue capacitors, in the later one as it had yellow capacitor. Six years later, disappointment struck again when the second Type 600 also presented a blank LCD. Over those six years, we only plugged this unit in when we were using it. Being we were in lightning country, that was one of our suspicions is that we took a lightning strike and it ruined the unit. It made no difference. So with the second failure, I went off to the attic and retrieved the original Viking and I found that it turned on and it worked for about an hour. And then the screen went blank again. What a tease. But inspiration came with a new search of the internet because in 2018, Hector posted on his YouTube channel how he fixed a newer model Viking by replacing the capacitors. Could this approach work on a machine that's 10 years younger? So with a very basic soldering iron without the service guide or a capacity tester, I decided to try a capacitor replacement. I focused on large larger electrolytic capacitors on the control board. While I know the basics of electronics, I'm not an expert. First thing I did was to measure the voltage at each capacitor I targeted. All of the capacitors seemed to have some relationship with ground except for one. The ones with an apparent direct relationship to ground have no voltage on the negative side of the capacitor. This 10 microfarad under the LCD suspiciously measures the same voltage on both sides. Neither side seems to be a ground for the capacitor. So what to order? All these capacitors original format is axial, meaning that the leads come out on each end of the capacitor. I did not remove any capacitor before ordering and this caused me some ordering mistakes. For the 10 microfarad, I ordered an axial electrolytic and aluminum capacitor as Hector's video recommends when possible. I could only find the aluminum in radial format, so I made sure the height was shorter than the LCD display. In my model machine, it appeared that there might be some clearance problems between the motherboard and the cover at various points, especially here at the bottom where the larger capacitors exist and it's very close to the edge of the machine. On the 1000 microfarad, I couldn't see the voltage. I found 35 stamped on the end and I ordered a 35 volt 1000 microfarad capacitor. When I removed it, it turned out to be a 40 volt and I opted not to replace it at this time. The 22 microfarad was my biggest worry. If you notice, it's at the bottom of the board closest to the cover. You can see it's 14 millimeter by 35 millimeter and is not a normal size that is commonly available today. Trying to order one of the right dimensions, I eventually ordered one of the wrong temperature. Uh, the one I received was 85 degrees Celsius. I decided not to replace the 2200 microfarad at this time because I did not want to put a capacitor in with a lower temperature rating that was directly off the power supply. Okay, at this point I'm going to remind you that you are dealing with mechanical and electrical parts. While much of what is exposed is low voltage, the mechanical parts could cause bodily injury, so make sure you proceed at your own risk. I always recommend that you pursue warranty services first as opening your unit may void any warranty. Many of the screws holding the covers together are different, so please pay attention to order. We're going to go ahead and remove the two screws behind the handle. You're going to need to remove the two small screws behind the needle. And one of those I had to use a very small flathead to get in there. Remove the two screws on the bottom at the end opposite the needle. Do not remove any other screws. All those hold the power supply and other things you do not need to touch them. Remove the needle shaft handle at the end and you do that by kind of pinching and pulling it off. Remove the white button next to the bobbin and refill control. That just pulls right off. Make a note of this little piece of plastic uh, which might fall out. It, I have no idea what it does but you may find it on the floor later so pay attention so you can put it back. The back cover pulls off first. There's a little clip above the needle opposite the screw you remove. Don't push too hard. It takes only a little bit of pressure. Ultimately, the back cover should come off fairly easily. Once you have the back cover off, there are two screws on the top that need to be removed that are holding the front cover. Before you proceed, note how the cover slides under the needle pad, as when you put it back together, you need to return it to this state. As you pull forward, work each side. The side nearest the needle has a screw mount which will get hung on the light. Pull it out a little on that side to bypass the snag. As the touch pad side of the front cover comes out, don't pull it out too far. There's a cable behind there that needs to be disconnected before you can remove it. Once the cable is exposed, pull the rectangular box around the cable to release it, and then gently remove the cable and pull away the cover. For tracking purposes, I usually put the screws back in the holes they came from. This eliminates mixing them up when I reassemble the unit. 
At this point, I plug the unit in without the control panel to measure the voltage on the capacitors. Keep in mind, you can't do this with all kinds of electronics. In this case, it didn't seem to break anything. I was measuring the voltages to ground from each side of the capacitor. Now is a good time to take a lot of pictures. Make sure you get all of the connectors, where the wires are coming from to that connector, as well as the screws that you'll be removing. Also make sure you have pictures around the right side where the speed controller is. Before we remove the connectors, these two connectors can be confused when reassembling. They're the same size. I put them backwards several times. I would recommend that you go ahead and mark these on both sides of the connectors, maybe an A on each one and a B on the, on the other one. They're both motor controls. If you connect them backwards, the motors work. They just don't do what you expect when you want them to. I will go over the symptoms of backward cables later on. All of the other connectors off the main board are different sizes, so I don't see many opportunities to screw them up, but feel free to mark them. The gray cable in the center is soldered in. We're going to remove the speed controller board and that's going to take care of that problem. So you want to swing around to the right side of the unit and there's one screw holding the speed controller in. Uh, you want to take that screw out and remove the speed controller so it comes off with the gray cable. At this point, take the speed controller daughter board and I went ahead and I taped it uh, to the top of the board so it wouldn't get damaged. So once you have all the cables removed, there are three screws that hold the mother motherboard in. On the top left, you'll see that there's probably a cable tie on that screw, and you'll also notice there's a black spring that runs down the left. You'll need to keep track of that. Remove the top left screw and the bottom left screw, and don't lose the piece of metal that's going to come off. On the right, there's a screw holding a cover holding down two transistors. When removing it, be careful not to let the metal spin and damage the transistors. The top transistor has some conductive paste. If you don't have any conductive paste, be careful not to wipe it off, and you'll be just to reassemble it with what's on there. So once all the plugs are removed and the screws are out, you can carefully pull the board forward, but be careful because there's one more wire attached in the back. This wire plugs directly into the center, and you're going to just pull that plug out. Uh, you can note the colors when you remove it, but I do not think this is a directional plug, and you can put those uh, plug back in in either direction when you're done. So once you have the board in hand, we're going to be working for the, on this board for quite a while. So what I did is I carefully screwed it onto a piece of wood. And I did that with two screws. I put some plastic uh, washers on there so as not to damage the board. And that allowed me to clamp the board into a vise so that the board stood up and I could get to both sides of the board. Uh, this is relevant because we'll be working on both sides of the board as we go through removing the capacitors. You do want to make sure that uh, on your model that uh, around those screw holes that are on the left side, if you do use it to mount the board, that there are no tracings or electronic components that are going to get damaged by this. Uh, of course, the other option is if you have a circuit board holder, then you are all set. Use that. Before removing the capacitors, I put a little mark on the positive hole with a dot. Positive on an axial capacitor is the side of the can with the indent on it. One possible challenge with this board is it has double-sided traces, meaning that on both sides of the board, there are traces coming off the connection and going to various parts of the electronics. When you remove the capacitors, you have to make sure you have sufficient heat to totally heat the hole and anything that may be accumulated on traces on both sides. On the 10 microfarad capacitor, you can see here on the positive link that there's a trace going down to this resistor. It passes under resistor 913. On the right side, you can see there's another trace going down to another resistor. If you flip the board over and you look at the negative terminal, there looks to be no trace on that side. But if you look at the positive terminal, there seems to be a trace there going someplace else. That would be an example of a post that's going to have a trace on each side. To reduce the possibility of overheating the capacitor when soldering, I use clamps on the wires nearest the capacitor to help dissipate the heat. I decided to use a desoldering gun to remove as much of the solder from the hole as I could. Uh, when using a desoldering gun on a larger hole, they work really well, and smaller ones are a little more challenging. Uh, after I removed as much solder as I could, I went ahead and heated the wire, putting a little pressure on the wire as it became hot enough to remove it from the hole. There are many desoldering techniques, and I suggest you go ahead and look online for any of those if you're interested. I would search on uh, desoldering electronic components. So I'm going to put the video footage at the end of my struggles removing capacitors. So once you get your new capacitors in and you think you have them soldered, you need to go back and visually check the soldering on both sides. And you may want to run some continuity tests to make sure that on the ones that were double-sided traces, that in fact you're making good contact with the trace on that side and that you have continuity to the next jump point. So once you replace all the capacitors you've targeted, you can actually go ahead and put the, bo the board back in. Reinstalling the board is somewhat straightforward. Uh, the first thing you need to remember to do is put that cable in in the back, in the center of the board, and plug that back in. 
Now the board, you'll have about an inch of play pulling the board out, and at this point you need to find all those wires that are gonna plug into all those plugs around the side, and you need to pull those wires out around the side of the board so that you can get the board flush against the panel and not trap any of the wires. So with the board floating there and you have all those cables out, I'd recommend go ahead and plug all those connectors in so if you're missing a cable or a cable's trapped behind there, you can find it and fix it now. If you go ahead and put the screws in, it's gonna create more work for you. Once you have all the plugs plugged back into the board, you can go ahead and put the tension strap on the uh, left side and put the two screws in, uh, making sure to put the wire management through the top screw if it was there. On the right, you're going to put the cap over the two transistors and put that screw in. I recommend screwing all this stuff in by hand. Uh, using power tools can only result in bad things at this point. After you put the main board on, don't forget to go around the side and put the speed controller back on with the one screw. So with the board back in, uh, I went ahead and ran a power test again. So I turned the unit on, and again, I measured my voltages to all the capacitors. Now, being I had two units to restore, I would say, looking at the results, that the 10 microfarad in the top center definitely had something to do with this. But you'll also notice that the uh, capacitor in the lower left had some uh, voltage changes with the fix. Uh, before we go connect the control pad and the, put the front cover on, now would be a good time to go ahead and look at your metal control bar uh, on the bottom that goes over to your bobbin and other area. You tend to collect a lot of lint there. Um, I took mine downstairs and then I blew it out with the compressor and a big wad of lint came out. So you may want to go ahead and uh, do that exercise. And also you can put a little dab of sewing machine oil around the bushings if you want. Okay, putting it back together, if you did what I suggested and put the screws back in the original holes, now you need to take those screws out and, uh, you know, keep track of them so we can put them in the right spot. First, you need to put on the front. Uh, so you're going to hold the front up. You're going to reinsert the cable into the control board. So as you put the front on, make sure that you slid the cover under the bobbin assembly on the left. At that point, you can kind of coax it on. Uh, you push it on. You may have to pull it out a little bit on the left to clear the light bulb. Once it's in place, you can put the two screws in the front cover that were on the top and the back. So glance around, make sure it looks like you didn't pinch any wires. So at this point, you want to make sure your handle's in place. So on one of my units, the handle was permanently attached. On the other unit, the handle came out. So you want to make sure for your model that the handle is back where it needs to be at this point. Once the back is back on, put the two screws in behind the handle at the top. Put in the screw behind the light and the small screw behind the bobbin assembly. And then you can flip the unit up Put the two screws in that were on the bottom opposite the bobbin assembly. And then put the handle on the end of the main shaft. So those are the steps of getting it apart and making the fix. From this point in the video, I'm going to uh, show you some footage of actually changing capacitors and some more information to help you out. So the first thing is when removing the old capacitors, you actually could cut out the old capacitors and what you're actually then removing and heating up is the wire. It might actually be a little easier for you. If you do cut out the old capacitors, don't cut the wire short. Because these are double-sided traces, you don't want to be pulling on these wires to get them out. Don't yank them out. What you're doing is applying a little bit of pressure when the solder hits temperature and everything is melted on both sides. You really want it to kind of easily fall out. Likewise, when you're putting in the new one, don't force it through the hole. Uh, in my technique, in the cases where the hole did not open up, I heated the wire near the hole until the hole and the wire heated up to the point where the solder was fluid, and then uh, I let it kind of gently go through the hole. Now the challenge there is you get it in, um, your tendency is when you pull away is to want to pull it out, and the solder can heal over pretty quickly, so uh, try to be steady in doing that. The objective is to end up with a capacitor as close to the board as you can get it. I was clearly too conservative with the heat, uh, trying not to ruin the capacitors. Make sure that your joints are good and that uh, when you resolder it, you have good flow on both sides. Now, if you have a multimeter, uh, don't go putting the probe in places you're not familiar with. Um, the very simple test that uh, I was doing was holding the negative to ground, which was the frame, and then uh, putting the other probe on the capacitor traces, which uh, should not do any damage. You shouldn't short anything out because the current flow is going from the capacitor to ground. So let's go over some of the symptoms or problems you might have and what the fixes might be. So let's say the speed is slow and when you push the pedal and it's not accel accelerating. Remember that daughter board we took off? That is the speed controller board. We want to go in and make sure we put that, that board on straight and that that little wheel is going through the sensor properly. If you find the needle is offset and not centering properly, or when you press the pedal rather than, and you're going forward and weirdly the fabric is pushing backward, remember those motor connections I was talking about? They're probably backwards. 
it's not uncommon that parts made at the same time can have similar failure rates. When I opened the second unit and I saw all the capacitors were a totally different color and had different production marks on them, it kind of ruled that out. Looking at Hector's video, he clearly has a model that's 10 years newer. Now granted, the capacitors look to be from the same manufacturer, but he's having similar problems. So is this really just a cat problem or is this a, an attribute in how they do their design? In an end state, the Husqvarna Viking sewing machine is a pleasure to use. You can use it continuously. It's got high speed, reliable stitching. You can not use it for six months, sit down, put a totally different thread in it, and it'll just work right away. If you've ever used uh, old sewing machines or different sewing machine, the tensioner drives you nuts and you're just constantly messing with getting it right before you can use it. Not with this machine. It's well worth trying to fix it. Uh, if you're gonna fix it yourself, great. If you have hesitancy about fixing it, you can talk to a, a sewing machine shop. Some sewing machine shops don't do component level repair. You could actually go to a TV repair guy that replaces stuff all the time. Obviously, he won't give you a guarantee, but uh, they were likely willing to change these capacitors out. But but go ahead and make sure you check the price and uh, compare that with what might be available online in the used market. Keeping in mind that anything used you buy eventually is going to have this problem too apparently. You're looking at $30 in parts or less and you're done. I did order most of my capacitors from Mouser. Uh, the advantage there is you get to go through and try to find the right one and pick the exact size and you know all the information about it. They generally have a shipping charge so make sure you try to order all of your capacitors at once and it doesn't hurt to have an extra just in case you need it. So hopefully you have success in fixing your Viking Rose if that's what you're up to, and I hope this video was helpful. Thank you.